Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. If you've been waiting for our special announcement, here it is. Me and the Colonel, we're going to be in Nashville July 9th doing a live event at Fat Bottom Brewery. Tickets go on sale this Friday at noon Eastern at truecrimegarage.com. And for more details about the event, check out truecrimegarage.com. Hope to see you there. Make sure you get your tickets this Friday. Thank you for all the support. Cheers, mates. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows it ain't no fun when the rabbit's got the gun. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain. Yes, Nucci Boochies, it's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on our featured beer of the week, Moon Juice Galactic IPA. This is an out-of-this-world India Pale Ale crafted with tons of Galaxy and Nelson Sovin hops that transcends all earthly pleasures. Moon Juice Galactic is by the good folks out at Santan Brewing Company. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's a cheers to some of our out-of-this-world friends. First up, a cheers to Jennifer in Buffalo, New York, also, a shout out to my buddy Trippy and the Bills Mafia. And a big shout out to Sarah in Boise, Idaho. Here's a cheers to Rob in Johannesburg, South Africa. And a big We Like You Jib to Jason, no relation to Sarah in Boise, Idaho. Next up, we have a cheers to Alicia in St. Albert, Canada. And last but certainly not least, we have Narda in Shutesbury, Massachusetts. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to our website and they helped us out with this week's beer run. And now our fridge is full, and for that we thank you. Yeah, BWRUN, Beer Run, thank you so much for supporting our garage show and keeping the lights on. It means the world to us, and that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The Long Island Serial Killer. This killer has a type. Ten bodies were found near a remote beach. We were dealing with a serial killer. All four killed by one killer. The Long Island Serial Killer. Shannon Gilbert is at the home of Joseph Brewer. And it sounds like she believes that someone is after her. She has said this over and over again to the 911 operator. By this point in our call, she is now on the phone with the New York State Police. They are trying to figure out where she is located so that they can offer some assistance in this situation. However, Joseph Brewer would like for Shannon Gilbert to leave his home. Michael Pack, her driver, is on location and he's trying to get Shannon Gilbert to leave the home. But for whatever reason, Shannon is not cooperating. Call me. 
According to, I think it's just a county in the for the first time. It's a county in the Why are you going to stop a county? I'm in the middle of nowhere. Let's go back to Manhattan. Right? We're in Long Island. We're out near the water. Please, stop. Okay, I'm going to go back to Manhattan. Please, Mike. Brother, come on. No, stop it, please. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Fine. Please, take my time to let you dive. Yeah, I'm going to near the water. And you dive? I'm going to say, I'm going to go back. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Sorry, I tried to clean up that audio as much as I could with also still being able to hear what she was saying. But it seems like Mike's going, hey, let's get out of here. And she's like, hey, are you going to kill me? And he's like, no, are you, are you crazy? Like, what are you talking about? He even says at some point, you're you're freaking me out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, it's, it's Mike wanting to get her to leave. And we've started to call him Mike now instead of... Michael Pack, because you can hear her saying Mike. You can hear other people saying Mike by this point on the 911 call. It also sounds like the operator is now may for one reason or another have reason to believe that Shannon is in fact in Suffolk County, because it sounds to me like the operator is either trying to transfer or asking if County is on the line and then getting no response the weird thing, though, is it sounds to me, Captain, like it's Shannon saying to Michael, why are you going to kill me? You know, where are we going? And he's saying, no, let's go back to Manhattan. We're, and he's again, he's trying to explain to her where they are. We're on Long Island near the ocean is what he says at some point. But it's very weird that this interaction to me with Michael and Shannon and again, we don't know what she's ingested. We don't know what she's on. We don't know her level of paranoia based off of things that she's witnessed or experienced or heard that night. Right. Or if it's paranoia coming from something else, from an altered state of mind. Eventually, another 911 operator is going to come onto the line. But what the transcript says is that Shannon Gilbert then says, please get me out of here, Mike, which is a complete contradiction to everything that she's saying to Michael Pack before this point. Why? I never do. I never do. Mm-hmm. Mike, please. Mike, please. 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 I can't, she did something that can, I don't know what phone she's calling from, but she can not back, can you hear where she's coming from? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She needs help. Oh, you're like, you know, I'm going to find my own way home. Because she's in the house with the female, and the female was the initial caller. So this is all set up? You, you set everything up? Remember, I waited for you. You told me you were going to find your way home, darling. What? You know, I'm not going to that. So this is all set up? I've never seen this before. Okay, you're going to Well, you joked me, right? Why? I don't know. Why are you doing that? All right, I'll say I was lying. I was lying. You did? Why? 
Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? Why? What's Why? 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 Hello? Please, get me out of here, Lee. Hello? You're being sarcastic. About this. You were part of this all along. I can manage it now. Please. Please, please. I'm begging you all. I just want to go home. Again, very hard to make out anything in that conversation. And you can almost hear her moving the phone around, probably rubbing against her clothing make it even more difficult to hear. Well, that's what I was going to say, Captain. Am I crazy, or does it sound like for m- most parts of that last clip that the phone, that she's not talking directly into the phone? Right. It almost sounds to me like the phone is set down on a countertop or a table, or she's just holding it, and it's picking up Michael's conversation and Shannon's conversation. And then at times, though, it's weird because it sounds like she's directly responding to the 911 operator, when the operator, again, asking for some more information to which we hear Shannon say, please. And it's difficult for me to say if she's responding to the operator or if that's part of the conversation that's being had off of the phone. Getting very confusing when she's saying at one minute, nope, I don't want to go with you, Michael. Then she's saying, hey, Michael, please get me out of here. And then she goes back to, Wait, you're a part of this. Yeah, she starts off by saying you're being sarcastic. Michael Pack responds with about what? And then Shannon says about this. You are a part of this all along. Yeah. And then Mike replies, what are you talking about? I just met him. I guess he's referring to Joseph Brewer. And you do hear Michael Pack when talking to Shannon. Again, some of his, some of the dialogue is inaudible. But you pick up little bits and pieces of what he's saying, and he's saying at one point, he's like, Shannon, like, what's going on? You've never acted like this, or you've never been like this before. Right. Almost like he doesn't understand what she's doing or or why she's behaving in this way as well. And I know it's offering some insight into the case, especially Shannon Gilbert's portion of the Long Island serial killer case, but not going to lie to you, Captain, I am... I'm, I think I'm as confused <laughs> I'm as confused as I ever would be so far. I'm hoping that something at some point in this in this clip or this 911 call will offer some form of clarity. Yeah, I agree with you. At this point, I can't make heads or tails at what's really going on. But based off of what we heard so far, and I want to circle back to something that you said earlier, and I'm starting to get the feeling that that might be might be right. And and you may have, may have just given us the short of it. If I could expand that a little bit, look, as somebody that's just listening in, trying to figure out what's going on, the best I can figure out what would make the most sense. And again, we could be trying to make sense out of a situation that there is no sense to be made of. However, I feel like what I'm listening to is a scenario where something happened, obviously, before she got on the phone. We can agree with that. Something prompted her to call 911. Right. There is an element of fear in her call. Someone's after me. Yes. And she clearly doesn't want to go with Michael for a, a portion of the call. She also doesn't really want to listen to Joseph Brewer for a portion of the call, the early portions. It almost seems to me, Captain, like there was an element of fear that prompted the call 
But for whatever reason, that element is not in that household anymore. That element may have removed itself or been asked to leave the property. It almost sounds to me like she's afraid of going. She's afraid of being where she is, but she's also afraid of going outside in the middle of nowhere. She even says we're in the middle of nowhere. Right. And she doesn't seem to be 100% confident that Michael Pack is going to be able to keep her safe or 100% confident in herself that she trusts him completely. Yeah, it's very, very confusing. But uh, to me, that's a great breakdown of what could be happening. Let's dive back into the call. Well, we can give them... What's the Five, seven, three, nine, three, zero, eight. Is that us? What's going on? I think so. Yeah. Extension answering. You're acting like that was the idea. That's the number that came in. Why are you sitting there knocking about the past then? Mm-hmm. Something's going to happen to me. There's nobody outside. Yeah, you could call it, but we're not going to know where it is. County should call it. Every time I'm counting on the number, it's over. Okay, okay. Get out of here. What's the phone? Oh, it does. So what's clearly happening, if you can make out anything there, the 911 operators are trying to figure out where the call is coming from. They're also trying to figure out some kind of strategy to put in place to figure that out, right? Like you can hear them say, well, maybe we should try calling this number or the county should try calling this number. Right. And here, here's an interesting thing to me though. Remember they were so reluctant to release this 911 call yet. They got nothing but bad press in 2010 and 2012 in the years that followed by people saying, look, they were so slow to respond to Shannon Gilbert's 911 call. Yeah. Police should be to blame here. Whatever happened to her, part of it's on their shoulders. A part of it is their problem. And to me, if I'm law enforcement, I'm going, you know what? We should have released this earlier because it sounds to me like these people are trying to do everything within their power, within their available resources to locate her. Sooner rather than later. I think it's 100% proof of that. We have to go back and say, well, why then refuse to release it when it paints you in a much better light than everybody was putting you in to begin with? Well, does that mean that they believe that there's evidence on here for their investigation against Joseph Brewer or against Michael Pack or something that Shannon could be telling us that could be key to the investigation? Maybe. Maybe. But then I have a problem figuring that out because they told us that Shannon Gilbert wasn't murdered. So it's a lot of stuff not making a whole lot of sense to me right now. But remember when I said it doesn't lean towards something nefarious if if Michael's not concerned about the phone call, if Brewer's not concerned about the phone call, if nothing bad is happening, who cares who she's talking to? But here in this clip, right at the end, you hear him say, like, what's the deal with the phone or or something to that nature? It's hard to hard to decipher what he's saying. Is he saying who's on the phone or what's with the phone? We know that the phone is referenced, but to me, those questions are completely different and would show a different level of concern right. or a specific area of concern as far as the male voice goes. It sounds to me... You know, we've had enough into this call where I think I can tell Brewer's voice from Pac's voice, even when they're not, when they're not very close to the phone. Yeah. When they're inaudible, you can still almost make out who it is. So whoever is asking Shannon about the phone, whether it's what's with the phone or who's on the phone, that sounds like Brewer to me. I agree. Hot Suffolk. It's got to be Suffolk, right? Hello? Stop it. Stop it, Mike. Hello, where are you? Huh? Where are you? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? What's your name? 
Shannon Gilbert. Where are you? I'm by, um, I'm in Long Island. And what's, what's wrong? Huh? What happened? These people are fighting to kill me. <laughs> this is where my alarm bells are going off. Because for whatever reason, she's not communicating this whole time with the 911 operators. You know, can you trace my call? But barely having any kind of conversation with them, right? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they make contact with her again. Again, these 911 operators are working their ass off to tr try to figure out what's going on. That's, actu that's an accurate statement. I've checked with them. No ass is left. No ass, no asses left after this call. But they're going, what's your name? Shannon Gilbert. We can't hear you. Sh Shannon Gilbert. Now, I guarantee you, now that she's answering these questions, these are questions that if you could only hear one side of the conversation, right? Let's say I'm Brewer or say I'm Pack, right? Mm -hmm. And I hear Shannon talking to somebody and she's going, my name's Shannon Gilbert. Now I know who she's talking to. She's talking to some kind of law enforcement or 911. She's reporting something. She's not speaking to somebody that knows her. She has to say, my name is Shannon Gilbert. Exactly. And then what does she say? They're plotting to kill me. It's clear as crystal, right? I feel like there was a guy somewhere that sat in a garage about six or seven years ago that had a suspicion that these guys these two guys were trying to kill shannon gilbert and he may have said that somewhere at one time and now we're finally hearing the 911 call and that sounds like what she is saying or trying to convey to law enforcement let me throw this at you here captain not too fast with the with her voice with her tone and her delivery she sounds a little like groggy to me almost like in a in a stupor like she's come out of a sleep yeah, she's mumbling. And so I wonder if, do we have a situation where something happened, something scared the shit out of her, terrified her, and she may have blacked out temporarily or, or passed out for a brief period of time. She comes to, she doesn't know how long she's been out, and she doesn't have a clear understanding of what happened or why she's so afraid, and therefore she can't convey it. She cannot explain it to the operator on the other end of the phone, because I'm not getting the sense that she's not telling the operator what's going on. Cause she's afraid to say it out loud in front of these men. I I'm not hearing a whole lot of emotion coming out of her either for someone that's supposed to be so scared. Like when she's, she says, Mike, I'm begging you to, to, you know, I want to get out of here. She says to Mike, finally, she wants to go home. There's no real beg in that beg. You know what I mean? There's no, yeah. there, these people are trying to kill me. It's it's just so relaxed and casual. Well, no, I think when she's saying they're trying to plot to kill me, that's it. It was pretty clear. Like I said, one of the clearer things that she said on the phone. Uh huh. I think that's a great point. Did did something happen where they fed her some kind of drugs, or did she take some drugs and then she blacked out? She comes to. She doesn't know what's going on. She now thinks everybody's out to get her, but it's almost like she has the guts to say, you know what? I, I'm on, I'm on the call with 911. I might as well say, look, these people are plotting to kill me, or at least that's what I think is happening. And she's smart enough. If she believes this situation to be real, which I think that she does, no matter how she came to this conclusion that someone's after her or trying to kill her, she clearly believes it. So in this situation, she's smart enough to know that maybe I don't know exactly what's going on. I haven't figured it out myself. I cannot tell law enforcement exactly what's going on because I, I don't understand it myself. But at the very least, if I have them on the other line, the likelihood of something happening to me while they're on the line is, is very small. Right. And so I'm going to keep them on the line whether I can tell them anything at all. These people are fighting to kill me. Where are you? What's your address? What's your address? 
What's your address? Oh, life, life, stop, life, yeah. Life, stop. Life, stop, life. Life, stop. Where are you? Life, life, stop it. Life, stop it. What's your name, Shannon? Huh? What's life, your... life, stop. Yeah. Where are you? What's your address? Hello? Yeah, hold on, then I know you're coming to the address. Hello, Sophia. Mike, stop it. You guys are finding something. Mike, where are you? Mike. Are you in the house? Yeah. Mike, what? stop it. What town are you in? Long Island, Mike. It's where? Stop, Mike. Where in Long Island? Stop it, Mike. Mike, stop it. Mike, stop it. Where in Long Island are you? I don't know. Hello. It sounds like they gave this 911 operator a bunch of muscle relaxers. <laughs> she sounds more intoxicated than Shannon sounds. You wonder if she's just trying to not sound frustrated or Where are you? trying to Where are further you? confuse the situation, right? Like right. cuz you don't know if if Shannon Gilbert's on the on the verge of just spazzing out completely and you don't want to run the risk of that happening because you don't know what's going on. You're confused about the situation being the operator. And I, it sounds to me like the operators just resorted to the, to saying, well, I, all I can do now is ask over and over again, where are you Right. to try to figure out where you are so that we can send someone there to see what's going on because we're not getting any information from the phone call. Right. Yeah, but like I said, I think they're doing a good job. They're doing the best they can with what they have, but I think they could have started asking more questions. Who are you with? Who's, yeah, who's that talking? Be, What's their name? She could tell names to the operator, but here's the thing. At the, at the end of the day, if this clip stops right here, if the 911 call stops right here, we know that it doesn't. It's a longer call than this. But if it stopped right here, Shannon believes in this moment, whether she's right or wrong or just completely off the rails, she believes in this moment that Michael and Joseph Brewer are plotting something together, that they're in cahoots with one another. Well, at least those two. We don't know how many other males are there. Right. Or how many people. Let's not just say males. There could be other women there. We don't know. But where we just stopped, she then, it's harder to hear that one because she's mumbling, but she says for the second time, they're plotting to kill me or they're trying to kill me. I can't imagine what is going through her head and the fear that is going through her head at this moment. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models 
to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org slash possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. All right, we are back. One of the strangest 911 calls we've heard on the show. That it is, my friend. That it is. Again, I apologize for the audio quality. I did the best I could. It's very difficult recording to hear, especially because a lot of the background noise and a lot of the phone noise against other items. Where in Long Island are you? I don't know. They're going to kill me. Are you in a house? Are you in a house? Yeah. Whose house is it? I don't know. Who is Mike? What's his last name? Mike what? How old are you? What's his last name? What's his last name? What's his last name? Shannon. 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 Yeah. What town? What town are you in? Hello. What's Mike's last name? Hello. Again, almost nothing's happening during that section in the room that the phone's in. Mm -hmm. You can't tell if that's two guys talking in the background or just somebody left the TV on. Yeah, but it does sound to me, and I've, I've tried to raise and lower different frequencies. To me, that section sounds like there is something brewing in the background. I agree. And then it's interesting to hear the two operators, you know, the one that's trying to communicate with Shannon, but there's clearly somebody in the background on her end too of the call because they're trying to sort things out. And one of the operators says to the other, one of the guys said, Hey, let's get, that's all you kind of hear. Like, yeah, like that she could on her end clearly hear them saying, Hey, let's do this or Hey, let's take her. And then that part gets so quiet that I cannot hear what the one woman says to the other. I'm sitting here going, getting ready to leap out of my chair when the operator's asking Shannon question after question over and over and over again of, I want to leap out of my chair and just say, 
God damn it, woman. Tell me something. Yeah. Tell me something. It's beyond confusing and it's beyond frustrating. She goes, he'll leave me. One of the guys said, let's go back to my Where are you? Where are you, Shannon? Shannon. 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 So she makes the statement that they're going to kill me or they're going to kill me now. And then, like you said, the 911 operator is whispering again about one of the men said, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if there's some kind of tussle or something, some kind of struggle for the phone, but it sounds like she decided at that moment, they're going to, they're going to kill me. I'm better off to just make a run for it. And what you hear at the end of the clip that we just left off is it's her running. And I'm guessing she's in like flip flops or something. Yeah. Who knows? I mean, we're hearing whatever kind of footwear she was wearing that night. And actually we, we would know what that is based off of her remains being found later and her, her belongings being found as well. But Yes, it sounds to me it, it's it's scary. It's terrifying to hear that there's this there's this long period where nothing is happening, and then all of a sudden it's two screams and and running is what I'm hearing. And we know that at some point that she flees the home and ran to Gus Coletti's home. So this must be the running that we're hearing there at that point. And I picture this as like the screams of her breaking out, busting out the side door, the front door to go running out into the darkness. Keep in mind, if you've looked up this street, uh, the fairway street on Google maps or on the Apple app, this this is a, is a street. This is a, a neighborhood where you can imagine that it's going to be very dark at night. It's going to be very dark outside. And we clearly know that she has not much of a clue of where she is. So it's the screams to me of busting out of that, that home and, and fleeing down the street. And again, terrifying because we don't know what's happening during that long period of silence where we hear virtually nothing. Right. And then it's the quick screams. I think that's one of them. My T zero eight is one of our expressions, I think. That's a bad one. Oh, did you call that one? Shannon? Hello? Right. 
During that clip, you can hear Shannon knocking on somebody's door. You have to remember that it is 4 a.m. in the morning, so somebody responding to a, a knock is not going to happen instantaneously. Yes, and the other thing, though, too, is we don't know how many doors she may have knocked on before arriving at Gus Coletti's home. From my understanding, his home is about two-tenths of a mile from Joseph Brewer's home. Joseph Brewer is located at 8 the Fairway Drive, and Coletti is at 17 the Fairway Drive. They're both on the same side of the street, but there would be three houses on that same side of the street that I can see, maybe a fourth. It's hard to say, it's hard to say what's under the trees there, but there would be at least three homes between Brewers and Coletti's. Again, a, <laughs> a lot of noise to sift through. But like you said, he's three houses away. She knocked on multiple houses until she got to the third one. You could hear Gus talking to her. I couldn't make out any of her replies. But she's she's running at a pretty quick pace for somebody that is possibly intoxicated or 
on some kind of drugs. Her her breathing is very heavy, and her response to what's the matter from Gus Coletti, she says, I need help. And that's all she says to Gus before then fleeing his front porch area. And as I said, there, there are three homes between Brewers and Coletti's on that same side of the street, but there are two homes between this distance on the south side of this street. So the two homes on the south side of the street are far enough away from the actual road from Fairway Drive. This, they may not have been visible to her, or she may not have wanted to go in the direction of either of them. If I had to pick where I would want to run in this situation, it probably would be the same direction that she went and then end up at Coletti's place. I think I would have stuck with those houses on that on the north side of that street and continued on that way. But this is where Shannon Gilbert's 911 call ends. And then we have Gus Coletti shortly after Shannon flees his home. He's going to call 911. Okay, traffic police, 873, what's the location of your emergency? Yes, this, uh, I live at Oak Beach in the association. There's a young girl about 14 years old running around here screaming, and there's some guy trying to follow her. What's the address there? I'm at 17 The Fairway. All right, you have a description of the girl or the boy? Pardon me? Do you have a description of the girl or the boy? The girl is about 14 years old, got blonde hair, very small. The boy, I can't tell, he was into like a, a, a suburban. What color? Uh, black. Did you happen to get a plate number or anything? No, I didn't. Okay, telephone number you're calling from? Four. Are they still on the fairway? Uh, they just went past the gatehouse where the entrance is. And what's the name of the complex? It's Oak Beach Association. Okay. Out okay. by Robert Moses. All right. We got somebody over there. I'll be watching. Oh, okay. Bye. We know because of the call that Shannon took off, left Brewer's house to try to get help, and now this is evidence that she's being at least followed by Michael Pack. After leaving Gus Coletti's home, Shannon will run another two-tenths of a mile to another road named the Bayou, where she will then have an interaction with a second homeowner, and this homeowner's name is Barbara Brennan. Suffolk Police 875, what is the location of your emergency? Uh, 40, 43, the Bayou. Some woman is knocking at my door. What town are you in? Oak Beach Association. What's the nearest corner street, though? Uh, Ocean Parkway. She says she's in danger. Do you know her or no? No, I don't. I'm not letting her in. She's banging on your door now? Yes. Did you say what kind of danger? No. Oh. And we live in a gated community. What's your name, ma'am? Uh, Barbara Brennan. And what's there a name to that community? Uh, Oak Beach Association. Oak Beach Association. And I have an elderly mother here. All right, I'll get somebody right over there, okay? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And as we said, this is another two-tenths of a mile from Coletti's to Barbara Brennan's house at 43 The Bayou. Really, I've looked at this a few different ways here, Captain, and Shannon could have taken any number of routes to get from Coletti's to Brennan's, and they're all about two-tenths of a mile. But we, we should be clear, if you look at this on a map here, it's not like she just continued on down the road and we should assume that she just continued on down the road. She could have gone, as said, three or four different routes to get to this other location. Now, this woman is afraid. She doesn't know what's going on. She's not going to allow this strange person into her home. And there's no real interaction that we hear on the phone between Shannon Gilbert and Barbara Brennan. But Based off of Barbara's words, it sounds like they did have some interaction before she placed this phone call. Now, we should also point out, too, that Coletti's call and Brennan's call are going to a different entity at this point. They're going to the Suffolk County Police Department. 
And that's because they live in Suffolk County. They're using numbers that are from Suffolk County. And when Shannon Gilbert was calling 911 earlier, because she's not from this area, she's probably getting a a very general number, emergency line, and they're trying to figure out where she is. Because remember, they keep asking her over and over again, are you in Nassau County or Suffolk County? Right. And she's not able to give them an answer. Now, she's transferred to the state police who are trying to figure out where she is, but both of these calls came into Suffolk County Police Department when they called 911. So they aren't fully aware that somebody else, the state police, was just on the phone with the woman that was running down the street knocking on people's doors. The question becomes, is Shannon connected to the other victims? I think there's too many coincidences we have. Same, similar body type, same profession, same way of contacting her to hire her. And then you have this 911 call. It's it's very confusing, but it's clear to me that she is afraid. It's clear to me that something happened to her or something was said or people were acting in a certain way to make her feel afraid. They then chase her later. She ends up in this marsh, you're going to tell me that at four o'clock she just runs into this marsh and gets lost. And then the, the sun comes up and she just is lost for days. And then that's how she dies. It doesn't make any sense. Now, if you told me she ran into the marsh and then she overdosed. Okay. But then who gave her the drugs? Was she given the drugs willingly or did somebody slip her the drugs? There's too many even just her body type, there's too many coincidences for me to not think that these are connected. And I think this 911 call shows the threat and shows the danger. And what's the end result? Shannon Gilbert's dead. Well, I say boil this down to its simplest form. And to me, what I hear is a woman that is scared that is afraid and that she has become afraid because of something she's witnessed or heard. And she's calling for help. She doesn't really know how to tell them to help her. And she fully believes that these two individuals, if not more are plotting against her, that they are going to kill her. And so on its simplest form, we know that she's found dead in this area. They don't recover her remains for quite some time. There's no level of clarity here in Shannon's situation to offer much in the way into an investigation for law enforcement. Even after they find her remains, I have the medical examiner telling me that it was a tragic accident that she's dead. We have another professional hired by the Gilbert family who says, no, the hyoid bone was broken and therefore she was strangled to death. She was murdered. This 911 call has not added any clarity to me for the Shannon Gilbert situation. If she was a victim of homicide, if she belongs in the batch with the rest of the Long Island serial killer victims. But we know one thing for certain. She was driven out to this area that night. And I I don't believe that this would be the first wild party that she has been hired to entertain. I don't believe that this is even the first gated community that she's gone to. I'm not saying that she's gone to this gated community before or even one near here. But what I do know is in between the distance in between the two locations where Shannon Gilbert and Michael Pack left Manhattan and where Joseph Brewer was having his party, they're going to find 10 remains on that stretch of, on that stretch of road between those two locations. I have a really hard time believing that it's just coincidence that Shannon Gilbert ended up dead that night after telling us what she told us on that 911 call. Again, I'm glad that they released it. I'm thankful that they released it. I actually think that it makes the officers and the people that worked that phone call painted in a much better light than we were expecting. 
after all the rumors we were hearing and speculation of, well, they didn't want to help her. That's not the vibe I got from listening to these calls. I got the vibe that, yes, they did want to help her. I got the vibe that Gus Coletti wanted to help her, that Barbara Brennan wanted to help her. They just didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what the situation was. And Shannon, for whatever reason, could not explain to them what was going on either. So to me, I'm not going to listen to this and say, nope, you convinced me otherwise. She's not a victim. Again, I'm not saying she is 100%. This just doesn't, it doesn't take her off of the potential victim list for me. And it really does not do anything to alleviate any suspicions I had of Joseph Brewer or Michael Pack from seven years ago. The Long Island serial killer. This killer has a type. Ten bodies were found near a remote beach. We were dealing with a serial killer. All four killed by one killer. The Long Island serial killer. Like I always want to thank you guys so much for the support. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading this week? Thank you for the support. Thank you for the wonderful gifts. Two weeks in a row, we are recommending books that were gifted to us. This week, we are recommending Unmasked, My Life Solving America's Cold Cases by Paul Holes. And this was gifted to us by a young man at CrimeCon, and I failed to write down his name. But he was the Columbus native who was wearing the Kozar for President shirt. So His name was Paul Holes. A memorable gent at that. In 2018, Paul Holes retired as a cold case investigator after spending more than 27 years working in Contra Costa County in San Francisco's Bay Area. Paul specialized in cold case and serial predator crimes. Check out Paul Holes' book, Unmasked. My Life Solving America's Cold Cases. You can find that great title and many other things that you might want to listen to or read or watch at truecrimegarage.com on our recommended page. Yeah, just a quick plug. We have three bonus shows that you can't get in the feed, but they are available on our store page. Three of them. One is uh, O.J. Simpson Part 3, Tony Muncie, and the Brick of Family Murders. So if you haven't heard those, you need to check those out. Until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter. Is it possible to predict the unpredictable? Could surgeons use a patient's own anatomy to create 3D-printed life-size organ models to map out challenges ahead of time, making surgery more precise, efficient, and less invasive? Is it possible? It already is. Because every day we're doing what's never been done. Learn more at mayoclinic.org possible. Mayo Clinic. You know where to go.